right, guys. Hey. Yeah, Woohoo. Time for class. Woohoo. Uh, so, today we're going to talk about characters. Yay. Uh, it's kind of interesting because a lot of times when I do this class, I start with character, but I just kind of play it by ear each time. So, we're going to do two weeks on character. Um, and we're going to start today with me kind of talking about what the purpose of characters are, is. Um, which kind of sounds a little silly. Like, we all know what the purpose of characters is. They're the people who do the stuff in the stories. Um, but characters fulfill different roles. And they, the way that you use your main characters in particular are going to form... Uh, is going to form a lot of the shape of your story and your plot. So today we're going to kind of just talk about this idea of characters as um, elements in your story. And how do you do things like make your reader care about them? When I, uh, when I was an undergraduate uh, studying creative writing, uh, this is one of those things that I kept asking and never got answers on in a lot of my classes. Um, a lot of my classes, I'd say, oh, I, that's great telling me about you know, searching for my soul in my writing. Wonderful. Want to do that. How do I make people like my characters? Um, how do I make people care about reading my story? Because a lot of the stories I'm reading by myself and the other students, I don't care. Um, how do we make people care? Uh, and so as I've thought about this and how to kind of talk about it, I've, I've divided it into kind of three ideas of how we make people care about our characters. And this kind of gets down to the, the kind of core reason you are putting, uh, using the core method you're, the core reason you're using a main character in the first place. Like you theoretically could tell a story without characters. Um, <coughs> There are some writers who I will not name who seem like they would much prefer to be able to write like that. Um, but uh, not naming names. We're not naming names. Uh, the first thing that I kind of think that uh, a character does for you, and one of the ways you make people care is you establish empathy. If you want the reader to care about your story, one of the ways you do it is this. Now, this is really, really important because I think that a lot of people who write science fiction and fantasy come to it from a world-building background. And you spend a lot of time on your world-building. You think about how cool it would be if X, Y, or Z happened. You come up with a, a creative and innovative magic system and all of these things. Um, but a magic system is only as interesting as the people using it. An action sequence is generally going to be meaningless if you don't care who lives and who dies. <coughs> Not always. There are some that the spectacle of the action scene itself is what propels you through it. But in general, in a story, if you don't care who lives and dies, that action sequence loses a lot of its power for you. Um, the setting is generally only as interesting in, as it, as in that it causes problems or an interesting place for your characters to travel. Um, and so creating characters that we care about so that all of these other pieces mean something is really important. And one of the most important things that you want to learn how to do in your writing. Now, character is one of these things that for me, um, I had a lot more trouble talking about character when I started teaching. And even still, um, the pieces of what makes a character work are a little more ephemeral for me. I, as a writer, I've told you before, I generally outline my setting and my plot ahead of time, and my characters I cast, meaning I say, all right, I'm going to try writing a character in this world. I'm going to see where this person goes, what their passions and dreams and hopes and fears are as I write them, and if that works, great. I'm going to keep going with that, and that becomes my character. If that doesn't, I put that aside, and I try something very different. Over the years, I've gotten so that I do this less and less, but I still, like for instance, my two big series, Mistborn and Stormlight, both basically started with me trying different characters and then putting them aside and trying new characters until I arrived upon the ones that worked. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about what made me decide they worked 
as opposed to other ones. But in your story, as you're starting off, one of the first things you want to try to do is establish empathy. Um, this kind of gets into the, the, the things I'll talk about uh, a little later. You might have heard me talk about them in previous uh, years, where I have like these sliding scales, where I talk about what makes readers interested in the character. Uh, one of them, of these sliding scales, that correlates to establish empathy is um, likability. Right? So we establish empathy for a character through a couple of different methods. Um, one of which is we show that they are like us in some way. Showing that a character is relatable immediately establishes empathy. Uh, another way that we do it is we make them nice. Right? Um, now, your definition of nice may vary, but we're kind of talking about this idea of uh, there's a famous screenwriting book called Save the Cat, right? Uh, the title of Save the Cat, where it comes from, is this old kind of idea in Hollywood that if you want someone to like a hero, you have them save a cat, and if you want someone to hate a villain, you have them kick a dog, right? Um, and the idea being that if someone is likable, if someone is, it ha they have normal human sympathies and things like this, then it will establish empathy. Um, this is why so often when a writer makes a, a villain, and they're very villainous, but you want to humanize them a little bit, you will show them doing something like us. Show them being, you know, they, they are this monstrous tyrant who wants to destroy half of the universe. But they still love their family in their own twisted way, right? That is like us. That's a normal, relatable, human sort of thing, or giant purple monster sort of thing. Um, and so, um, let's see. Um, there's one more I have in here. Another thing that you can do to establish empathy is show people liking them. This is really handy. Um, we will instantly like someone who is liked by other people. This is how it works. Um, and this is, you know, showing a character having a family or showing a character having friends. We will immediately say, well, somebody likes them. Maybe I will as well, right? So build, establish empathy. Now, I want to make it clear as I go through these things, you do not have to do each of these things for every character. These are just ways to get us emotionally invested in your story using character. Number one, establish empathy. Um, number two is, let me get this uh, wording right, um, establish rooting interest. So what I mean by establishing rooting interest um, is that you are going to show that what the, um, the character wants is interesting to us. So this is basically giving the character a motivation. You're going to show us what the character wants. Characters who want things are naturally more interesting to us than characters who don't. Um, this is why Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is so interesting, because it has a protagonist who doesn't want anything, really, uh, other than maybe a nice cup of tea. And uh, what's that? Yeah, British. Um, but the story, the story is doing that intentionally to be a farce by showing here is a protagonist who refuses to protag. Um, <laughs> right? Um, and so establish your interest. You want to have a character want something, even if it is just a cup of tea, right? Um, you want a character who wants something out of life that they generally can't have. And that's another thing is, uh, what do they want? Why can't they have it? This is going to kind of spiral into their flaws, or their handicaps, or their limitations, right? Why, why can't the character have this thing that they want? Um, you also can generally establish in rooting interest, you can establish the personal connection to the plot.
All right. Um, Luke doesn't really want to become a Jedi. He doesn't really hate the Empire. Till they kill his parents' figures, and suddenly it's personal. That phrase, suddenly it's personal. There's a reason why that has uh, become a cliche of storytelling, because one of the things that you do in establishing rooting interests is you make sure that there is a reason that your protagonist is connected to the plot. Um, number three up here is, um, I'm going to go right across this thing. All right. Three bunched up is um, progress. It's relating back to the plot stuff we said. Establish the progress, the sense of progress that you're going to have with the character. In other words, what is, how are they going to change? You do this by showing a flaw that they have. Or you establish some sort of journey they're going to go on. Right? Um, this is dovetailing into the, all the stuff that we talked about with, uh, with, with plotting. So the goal for this one is oftentimes you will, you will, this will be driven by a sense of mystery or a question. Will they be able to become the thing that we know inside they can become? Will they be able to... Um, to, will Spider-Man become a superhero? What's his journey? What's our arc? How are going, you going to signpost this character changing? What is supposed to change? Boy, I wrote that one bad. That says going to change. Uh, we'll fix it in post. Um, <laughs> we actually won't, but... So these are your, your, your primary tools in creating a character that we want to read about. You are either going to make us like them, or you're going to give them a motivation that sounds really interesting, or you're going to show them on a journey where they themselves are changing and we want to see what happens. Um, you can do all three. You can do one of the three very well. And if I'm relating these um, a, a few years ago, um, I came up with this idea uh, that I could really describe a lot of characters um, on a sliding scale uh, with, with three different toggles, right? Three different sliding scales. I wrote one over there, but I'm going to do it on this board. So the first was likability. The second one was proactivity. And the third one was uh, competence, right? Um, and that characters tended to fall somewhere on a scale um, of these three ideas. And I relate these three ideas to kind of these three goals of making you want to read about a character. Um, now, these things intermix, and they are not distinct uh, from one another, right? Like, your proactivity and your competence are generally going to go hand in hand, uh, for instance. But the idea is that your likability is how much empathy you establish for the character in your story. Your proactivity relates to their motivation and what they're doing to achieve that motivation. And their competence has to do with where they are on that kind of progress scale of getting better at whatever they want to do. Do you understand that when I say competence, I'm not necessarily just meaning how good they are at sword play. Um, a person's, um, if you were writing a story about someone that was very shy, that the arc of the character was they were going to become very outgoing and then run for the presidency, right? Well, the core competence for that character is that shyness versus ex introvert, extrovert thing where they are learning how to stand up and talk in front of people, which is still a competent slider. Uh, just, you know, yes, they're not learning how to wield a sword or use the one power, but they are still growing in competence in some area that specifically uh, involves the plot. And what I realized is um, I could have characters moving on any one of these actual scales to create a sense of motion and progress for the story. For instance, a character who is growing less and less likable through the course of the story can be a really interesting story. It's a different story, however, than a character who is growing 
increasingly in likability through the course of a story. In the same way, a lot of characters start off inactive and become proactive, and that is the way that they are moving. Um, a lot of characters start off with no competence and move up in competence. You don't usually move down in competence, but there are a few really interesting movies about someone losing their competence. Um, and the idea is that your motion here is part of how you're telling your story. Um, now, I want to stop here and mention something that a friend of mine, Howard Taylor, calls an iconic hero. Um, this is a phrase I think he got from Jim Zub. Um, the idea behind an iconic hero is a hero who does not change on any of these three, or, or if they do change, they change very slightly on one of these three through the course of a given story. These are your, uh, James Bond is usually the classic example of the iconic hero, though with various reboots they will move him down in competence and then slowly move him back up again. Um, so it really kind of depends on which story you're talking about. Same thing with a lot of the superheroes. Uh, a lot of superheroes, it's like, we know where they are on this line, and we're going to have an adventure with them experiencing this. Um, an iconic hero generally is going to have one or all three of these ramped to the top so that they cannot move anywhere else because they are already as competent and capable as they can be. Um, and um, these can be fun to read about. You don't have to have progress on these scales to, uh, to in order to have a story. But I have found the majority of stories I really like are involving a lot of motion on these scales by different characters. Um, for instance, we have uh, Star Wars, one of my favorite movies, the original, right, where we have lots of movement here, right? Uh, at the beginning of the story, where would you say Han Solo is on these three things, right? The likability. Where's Han on likability? Yeah, yeah, he's good. He, 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 we we kind of like him, but we're like, yeah, right? Um, where is Han in proactivity? Depends on which, uh, which of these things you're talking, but yeah, Han has to kind of be pushed into things. He does shoot first, <laughs> right? But where it comes to, you need to give him a lot of money. He's just sitting there, right? Um, where is Han in competence? Han thinks he's up here, but he's actually like down here, right? <laughs> that's, that's the fun of Han, um, is he probably knows where he is on the other ones, but he's not, yeah. He, he, um, and through the course of the story, we are going to boost his likability. We're going to boost his proactivity a ton, right, by making him come back and not have to get paid to save everybody. And his competence basically stays the same, but, you know, that's Han. Um, um, where, is, where is Luke, right? Low, he's pretty high on likability, I'd say, from the get-go. That's Luke's job, is you come into the story, you see him looking at the twin sunsets, you have him, you know, fixing things for his, for his parents and wishing he could be whatever. Like, the whole point of Luke is to establish empathy. His goal is, if we go, Luke is, like, supposed to be up there. Whether you actually like him or not, uh, this is what his role is supposed to be. But where is he in proactivity? He thinks he wants, he might actually be a little bit, no, he's probably down here, <laughs> right? He thinks he wants to go off and be a fighter pilot. Has he actually done it? No. He has to get booted out of things just like, um, like Han does. Where is Luke's competence? Yeah, yeah. Like he's a good pilot. He doesn't have to learn that. So it's kind of like Luke has two. He's up here and down there, and you'll see this in a lot of things, um, where a character's really good in one area, but really lacking in another. The main place he has to learn, though, is in the Force, right? Which is, the, his growth arc is for him being in the Force from here to like here, right? Um, and then the next one goes here, back down to here, and then the next one, it's like here. Well, he's already there, then he's up here. Um, like, this is, this is the idea with Luke's character. Uh, where is Leia? on likability. Yes. Leia's pretty darn high on likability. We start off as little ship being chased by big ship. Um, and, you know, things like that. Where is Leia in pro proactivity? High. Very high. 
Yeah, Leia's the only one who does anything in the movie, um, <laughs> right? Everybody else has to be shoved into it, even Obi-Wan Kenobi, by Leia, right? Um, like, Leia and R2 were basically the only people who do anything in the, the, the movie. Um, and where is Leia in competence? Yeah, she's in her realm, she's probably pretty high. So, Leia's pretty iconic, wouldn't you say? <laughs> this story is not a, necessarily about Leia changing, um, it's about the growth and these other things. So, um, I find it a lot of fun just kind of thinking about where do various characters um, fall on this, how, what characters are horribly unlikable but hugely proactive and competent, so we read about them anyway. People like a lot of uh, villains, like, uh, say, Joker. Um, generally, it's like, we've got someone who's hugely proactive, middle competence, but makes up for proactivity, and generally not very likable. Um, but we want to read about them because that proactivity just grabs a hold of us. They have really interesting motivations. Usually when someone is high on the pro pro proactivity scale and they are not going to be changing on that, you establish a really stellar motivation. Uh, what is Leia's motivation in Star Wars? Save the galaxy, Save the galaxy right? Uh, she has huge motivation that only gets higher through the course of that story in that like, she's basically the only one trying to save the galaxy. Um, the only one left after everybody else gets killed. Um, but, you know, Luke, what is his motivation? He wants to go off and you know, he wants to look at the twin sunset and get out there, right? So his, instead of establishing a really strong motivation at the beginning of the story, we have to lean back on empathy, right, for Luke. Han's motivation? Get money, right? So we lean a lot on Han's competence at the beginning. Like, he's the person that can shoot the other guy before the other guy can shoot him. He's the guy who can get this ship to run past the, the, you know, the, the enemy blockade or whatever that's trying to stop them. He is the guy who can get them where they need to go. We like Han because he's competent, and that competence makes him cool. Now we, learn, we find out that he maybe has an overinflated opinion of how good he is at some of these things just by his actions, by, like chasing an entire group of stormtroopers by himself. Um, <laughs> But the idea is that we're going to have each of these characters doing a different thing for us in the movie, and we start off strongly with each of them kind of in a different realm. Uh, this is a great way to do your storytelling, right? This is why so often you have um, the young hero who kind of needs to be forced out but has a hidden competence and is really likable. And then you also have, you know, this old wise mentor who is highly competent but maybe, you know, is not necessarily as likable as relatable. Uh, not a lot of people relate to Gandalf. They do kind of because Tolkien does a decent job and Jackson does an, uh, an even better job of making him likable. But this idea of I'm more like the guy in the Shire than I am like the powerful wizard is generally the way that stories work. Um, it's a reason... Um, I often say why Spider-Man tends to be a lot of people's favorite superhero. It's because he starts off very established, empathy likable. Uh, rather than starting the story with him having all these powers, it hits uh, empathy, empathy, empathy. He reads comic books and plays video games. Target audience, um, <laughs> right? He gets bullied at school, target audience. Um, He's a, he's a nice guy who's in love with the girl next door but is too shy to go talk to her, target audience, um, right? And then what, does he, what is his journey? Competence skyrocketing through the roof. Extremely likable at the start, and we're just going to show him becoming awesome. He starts as Frodo, he ends as Aragorn, um, right? Um, and that journey... Getting to see Frodo become Aragorn is a really powerful story to tell. Um, so why do, I, why do I, I hit on this? Why do I talk about this? What is, what is the point? Um, the point is to start you thinking about your characters and the, the story you want to tell and their role in that story. Stories work by a sense of progress. Plots move because we see things changing. And you're going to want to decide with your characters if how much them changing is a part of what you want to make people turn your page, or if instead 
you are just going to have your story be competence um, overload and watching really cool people do really cool things. Ocean's Eleven, really cool people doing really cool things. Is there a journey in that? Not really, right? We are just going to be awesome and wisecracking and we're going to accomplish cool things. Um, different types of stories then, for instance, Spider-Man, where almost always there is an overlap of a change in character motivations over time, signified by a change in proactivity. What does he do at the start? He lets the villain get away. Um, how does that change his motivations? It makes it personal. Suddenly he needs to be more, more motivated and usually you will often kind of interweave a change on proactivity with a change in competence, overlapping one another to the point that by the end the character's motivation has shifted. We call this um, in storytelling, screenwriters talk about this a lot, it is a at the beginning of a story, you often show a difference between what the character wants and what they need. Spider-Man wants to be famous and cool, he thinks. What does he need? He needs, no, what he needs is to understand that with great power comes great responsibility, right? He needs to understand that the things he wants should be used for good instead of evil, and he needs to have a motivation shift. You see this very, very commonly in this type of story also, where what the character says they want at the beginning is not actually what they need. Um, that contrast can create interesting character conflict. Now, the last thing I want to talk about this before we kind of move on to an, another topic um, is this idea of flaws, limitations, and handicaps. Um, I think that Sanderson's Laws, uh, the humbly named Sanderson's Laws, have a lot of application to characterization. Um, and if we're going to look at Sanderson's first law as this kind of law of foreshadowing, I would say that if you apply it to characters, we are looking at motivation. A lot of times when characters go wrong, when I'm reading works by new writers or when one of my books has gone wrong and I'm getting beta reader feedback that confuses me, is because I have not properly established character motivation at the start of the story, so that when they later make a decision or accomplish something, it feels in line with who they have become and according to their motivation, right? Um, a lot of times if dialogue feels stilted, if your readers are like, something's wrong with this dialogue, it's not a one-to-one, -one, but a lot of times what's happened is you have established a character as one type of character, their motivations are a certain set of motivations. But when you get to this conversation, you realize, I need an argument here. It'll make the conversation more interesting. So you have an argument between them and someone else, and the reader's like, this feels stilted. This feels cardboard. What they really mean in that instance is, you are having a character act contrary to their motivations in order to move the plot in some way. Sometimes this means you need to revise that scene so they work according to their motivations and you'll have a better scene. Sometimes it just needs, means you need to back up and establish motivation. One of the things that's fascinating about characters, um, about human beings in general, is that we tend to wear a lot of hats and we often have conflicting motivations that are driving us in different directions. You probably have these as well. You have a perhaps duty to your family and what your family wants of you and your own sort of duty to your own inner desire to become a novelist instead of a doctor, right? <laughs> um, Brandon going to college had both of these motivations working on him. Um, and at home, they're like, you're going to be a doctor, right? And he was saying, yes, I'm a biochemistry major. That's kind of the point. But inside, I'm, I was screaming, no! <laughs> um, you have a lot of these. Oftentimes, the intersection between our family life, our social life, our religious life, and all of these things create conflicts. If you can properly show that the, this of a character, readers will not feel that the character is acting uh, against their motivations. Readers will accept this. And in fact, sometimes it is dangerous to give a character only one single motivation. Uh, my example of this is a uh, worked much better 10 years ago uh, when I taught this uh, class in the early years. Any of you watched Lost? Yes. Okay, there's like three of you. Uh, uh, so in Lost, 
Uh, oh, nice. In Lost, um, there is a character named Michael. I got his name right, right? Who has an extremely uh, strong uh, establishment of empathy in that he is a, a father who has kind of been a bad, deadbeat father and has decided to be a good father now. He loves his son. Um, he's got a lot of empathy, and he's got an established motivation. This man loves his son and wants to be a good father, okay? You would think that would be a recipe for a really strong character, right? Um, he is everyone's least favorite character. The lost guy is, is, is nodding his head. Everyone hates Michael. Maybe not everyone, but almost everyone. And this is really strange. It's a great case study for you to study because in the show, Michael's son gets captured and kidnapped by an evil, mysterious group. And you would think, all right, we've got a father who's trying to be better. We see him moving up in um, likability. He's got an established motivation. Uh, he loves his son, and his son's been kidnapped. This is a really powerful story, and everyone hated it because Michael became one note. The characters would get together to plan what they needed to do for the next step of whatever they were trying to accomplish. And it would be like, character one talks about this, character two talks about this, Michael, my son! And then the next character. Um, and then they'd go to another situation, and they'd all be doing something else, and he'd yell, what about my son? They're like, what do you want for lunch, Michael? We have sandwiches, or my son, where is my son? Right? Um, and it became so one note that everybody hated it. Now, this is, I um, point to two problems with this, right? The first one being one note character. Um, a one note character whose emotional state does not change or vary will get very tiring unless you do something else to make sure that there is a lot of progress going on. And that's the bigger problem. We never really saw any progress that he was making or that anyone could make toward his uh, saving his son. And so because of it, it felt like every time he yelled, my son, but my son, was just reminding us that we hadn't made any progress, that nothing was happening, that all it was is, yeah, Michael's going to yell about his son. And it got very distracting and kind of annoying because all sorts of exciting other things were happening. And we thought, we're like, I should care about this guy's son. I really should. But he's boring. So I don't want to hear about his son. Um, and this is, this is a, a kind of flaw in approaching how that story was written. Now, Lost, particularly season one, is fantastic. Um, and uh, I, would, I would hold up a lot of that writing uh, against a lot of other television show writing and things like this. But it did have this one kind of glaring flaw. Was that season one with Michael? Yeah. Um, right off the bat, uh, you, you kind of contrast that to a character who should not be very likable to us. He is a drug addict who is doing almost everything he can to get more drugs. Um, he's played by a hobbit, which does help, um, I'll admit. But you shouldn't, you know, he should be kind of low on likability um, and things like this. But he often ranks as people's favorite character in the whole season, right? Uh, this is Charlie, right? Did I get his name right? Um, and Charlie was my favorite character, and a lot of ways he shouldn't have been nearly as likable as he was, but he was proactive, and he was trying, and we saw his progress through the course of the season, where at the end of the season, he, you know, turned down the drugs, right? They found a big stash of drugs, and like Charlie, Charlie, like, he made, he had some mistakes in the middle, but then they sent him on another one in season two, right? Uh, he relapsed. But at least in season one, there's this, like, there's this really great arc, and we saw m progress, motion, and proactivity. And so the character that on paper, you'd be like, who do you like? The drug addict who's hiding his drug addiction from everyone else, or the man who loves his son and has lost his son? On paper, you would like this guy. Charlie was way, way better a character, and everyone loved him. Uh, study situations like that. When you see a movie, and you know you're supposed to like someone, and you don't, ask yourself why. When you read a book, and you're really interested in the antagonist plot line, and you're bored by the protagonist uh, uh, plot line, ask yourself why. And how does it fit into the ideas of empathy, rooting interest in progress in that character, all right? But regardless, established motivation, Sanderson's first law. Second law, flaws 
limitations, handicaps. Now, we talk a lot in building characters about character quirks. Um, and on one hand, I like this idea that we talk about character quirks, stretching ourselves to be a do something a little more interesting, a little more different. But sometimes it is too easy to mistake a quirk for a personality. And the way that you, at least I divide between the two, is I make sure when I'm coming up with flaws, lim limitations, handicaps, these sorts of things, that they are going hand in hand with something on this board. And when I add interesting quirks to a character, I want to make sure that those quirks of character are somehow fitting in to this. Now, a lot of times, you can do this in a simple way. For instance, if you are going to have the quirk, the character is a stamp collector, right? And this is an action adventure story. The character is probably not going to, you know, stamp collecting does not play a lot into the actual main plot. But what you can do is you can establish this character being proactive in a very small sphere when they can't be proactive in a large sphere. If you start off the story and show the great lengths they will go to to get this stamp that they really want, and then you show they collect the stamps because they don't get to travel because they don't have the funds for it or maybe they're too sick for it and they dream of traveling and they open their book and they put the stamps in of the places that they would have gone if they didn't have this handicap, then suddenly you have a character who is, has an interesting quirk and you have established a huge amount of empathy and you have started to establish motivation. When they get invited on an adventure and have to go on it despite their handicaps or limitations, you know this character is like, wait a minute, we have to go to Morocco? And you've seen they don't have Morocco yet in their stamp book. And even though they don't think they can do it and they're more, mostly not proactive and they're a character who's mostly been sitting in their house, you will be like, you know what? I can believe this character will take this jump to go to Morocco on this crazy quest with whoever, Nicolas Cage, let's say. Because um, that's what Nick Gage does. He shows up and takes you to Morocco. Um, or, or to the Cthulhu mythos. Um, so stay away. Um, uh, but regardless, you can make that leap. And if you have got a quirk that can somehow connect to all of these things, you are going to have a much stronger character. Rather than, oh, so random, this character is um, a taxidermist. And it doesn't really matter. It doesn't spiral in. They just like taxidermy. Yes, that could be interesting. But if you can connect it, it's going to be better. Um, I think the same way about flaws, handicaps, limitations. Now, I do divide in my head what these three things are as different things. You do not have to use my definitions. But uh, kind of as a reminder, a flaw is something that the narrative is indicating that is wrong with the character that they should have fixed by now, right? Something that they, would, they were capable of fixing before, hadn't quite managed to do it, um, and through the course of this story, you are indicating that flaw, they're either going to learn to fix this thing or it's going to be their downfall. Their great hubris, if you're in a Greek play, is kind of classic for this. But it's a thing that they have control over, right? Um, a handicap, I, say, I put as something that must be overcome, absolutely must be overcome, but is something that is not the character's fault and they have no power over whether this thing can be changed. Now, some handicaps through the course of the story will be evaporated by the story. Um, but it, the, the point is, the character up to this point, you don't blame a character for being, um, you know, being born blind. And this is a handicap, and you frame the story a very different way. A limitation for me is a thing that is not to change not to even overcome. It is a constraint you work within that you don't necessarily want the character to overcome. The fact that, um, that 
uh, Peter Parker loves Aunt May and doesn't want her to become in danger is a limitation of your story, and that should generally not change through the course of the story. But it is something the character would have power over. You just don't want him to change it, right? Um, that is kind of how I divide these things, th th three things in my head. So when you're building your character, I would recommend that you think about limitations, flaws, handicaps, and ask yourself, how does that create motivation for the character? And how does that create story? Just like with magic systems, most of your stories are going to hit the character in a place where they have a flaw, a handicap, or a limitation. Um, and most of your conflict is going to arise out of the fact that they have flaws, handicaps, limitations. Let's stop and ask for questions. That was a big old fire hose of stuff. So let's, let's see what you guys want to talk about. And let me ask, go ahead. Excellent question. So how do you work with multiple character view point of views in this? So uh, one of the first things I will decide is how much viewpoint time I'm going to give to each of these characters. And the more viewpoint time you have, the more nuanced you can be in a lot of these things. Uh, I'll get to this in a sec. One of the best ways to make a character feel real is to not be writing them to a role. This is something I learned early in my career. I often share this story, so I'm sorry if you've heard it before. But early in my career, I had a big problem writing female characters in my books. This is before I got published. Um, I would get feedback back to be like, this is a really exciting adventure. All the women feel like cardboard cutouts that you have set into your story that people then you know, barely interact with um, that are part of the set dressing. Um, and this you know, bothered me a lot. That's half my characters. Um, well, that's 10% of my characters, because I was a young man writing books who hadn't realized that yet, right? <laughs> um, uh, but it should have been 50% of my characters. Um, I thought about it a lot. I worked on it. And it was not like one revelation that made me get better at it. But one of the big things that changed for me was I started to realize I was writing characters to roles. Um, I would say, this is the hero, therefore they have this. This is the love interest. That is her role. I am going to write her as the love interest. This is the goofy sidekick. I am writing the goofy sidekick to a specific role. And this was really limiting my ability to make the characters feel real. Um, and when I started to kind of embrace this idea that every character is the hero in their own story, every character you may, they're the protagonist, I should say, in their own story. They may not be the hero, but they're the protagonist. Um, every character sees themselves as the main character. Um, every character has passions, desires, dreams, hopes, all of these things that would have continued on existing if the main plot hadn't run into them like a freight train. And it became very important to me to start establishing who all these characters were and who they might have become if the plot hadn't taken over their lives. Now, that's all a big preamble to the less time you have with a character, the more difficult it is to write them to anything but a role. This is kind of going to be a give and take, a push and pull that you have with your characters. And if a character is only going to be on screen, quote unquote, um, for one chapter, they aren't going to have a viewpoint in that chapter. What can you do? Well, in that case, you generally, your best bet is to give them one identifying characteristic that does not seem to dovetail into their role um, to, make, to force yourself to kind of write them to a personality rather than just to, this is the person who comes on stage, gives the hero their sword, and then walks off stage. Um, but, right. How do you do this for multiple characters? So when I'm building a story, I'm always kind of looking for friction points between the setting and uh, different parts of the setting, between the setting and the main plot I'm coming up with. And I'm saying, what if I put a character at that friction point? And I'm trying to make sure that each of my main characters um, has multiple motivations that make sense and is going to be moving somewhere on these sliding scales is trying to accomplish things. And I ask myself, what are they trying to accomplish before the plot happens? And how do they work into what the plot is doing? And how can I make sure that they have a personal connection to the plot? Um, 
This is much easier if you have multiple viewpoints. If you don't, you can still do it. Um, takes a lot of practice. All right? Go ahead. So why would characters have motivations and not goals? Why use, why use motivations over the word goal? Right. Um, so a couple reasons for this. Goals can be accomplished, and then your story is done. Motivations continue, right? Um, motivations are much easier as you as, a, as an author to, th to kind of get in your head who this character is. Um, a goal will be something like win the championship. The motivation is why do they want to win the championship. Giving them a goal is OK. Giving them a motivation, letting the reader understand why they want to live the championship is actually where most of your story is going to lie because it can then intertwine with things like the character's sense of progress and stuff like that, right? Um, you don't always have time for this. Um, for instance, if we go back to Star Wars, which I use a lot, we don't really know in the movie why Han Solo, well, we do. He wants to pay off Jabba the Hutt so he won't die, right? Right, that's motivation that's not as strong as, you know, why did he become a bounty hunter, or not a bounty hunter, but a smuggler? Why did he do this? And all of that sort of stuff, they just couldn't get into. But they gave him a goal, I need to get money, why? To pay off Job of the Hut. His goal then changes. My friends are more important than paying off Job of the Hut. Gee, I hope this doesn't come back to bite me, um, right? Um, so goals can shift, motivations kind of become a core of who the character is, and I just think it's better overall to be asking yourself those why questions. You don't always have to establish them, like I said, but asking yourself, why does Luke want to get off world? Um, why does, uh, you know, does Princess Leia want to save the universe? That one doesn't work as well because basically, you know, destroying all life in the universe, bad idea. Um, but there you go. Um, other questions? We'll go back here. How can you use your story to teach your characters the lessons they need instead of having the characters learn lessons? Right. Say you had a character that you couldn't control, they controlled themselves, how could you write a story that would help them learn? All right. So repeated for the, uh, the internet audience, um, how can you make the story get the characters to become who they need to be? Um, and there was a second part of this. Um, how, if your characters don't want to do what you want them to do, how do you make them do what you want to do? So this is... This is um, Let's do that second question first. People often ask me, what do I do if my characters just don't want to do what I want them to? Um, which is an interesting question to answer because it's a very discovery writer question for a very outline writer author. Even someone who kind of discovery writes their characters. Um, I generally don't think in terms of my characters doing things I don't want them to. But I understand the mindset, right? What you're meaning is, you are generally, you're writing along, you're like, this character is developing to be someone that wouldn't do what I've planned for them to do. Or they're going in a really interesting direction, and I really like this interesting direction, and I kind of feel like I want to keep writing on it, but it's going to go way off tropic from what everyone else is doing. Um, or things like this. And I get that sense. I understand that. Um, when I get into that situation, what I do is I back up and I say, all right, let's take a hard look at this story. Do I need to rebuild my story to fit who this character is becoming? Is the story a stronger version, is it a stronger story if this character continues on this path? Or is this character going to completely take over the story and it's going to turn into something completely different? Um, and I will either pull out the character, set them aside, and write, rewrite a character from scratch, or I will rebuild my outline completely to match where this character is going. I do the second more often than the first. Um, because if I'm really interested in character, personally, I am really good with plot and setting. I know I can rebuild that plot and that setting. Um, and if I've captured something in a character that's really working, I generally want to see where that character goes, and then I rebuild my plot for them. Um, that's a different question than, than kind of the first one, which is how do I arrange the situations so that they will teach the characters the thing I want them to teach? Um, I would say you need to hit those characters in the places it will hurt, right? Um, if what you need is a character 
to stop being selfish, you need the, their selfishness on screen at some point to cause that character a lot of pain um, or the people around them a lot of pain. If you want a character to make a difficult decision later on, show them failing to make that decision early on and show the consequences, right? Uh, hit your characters hard in their flaws if you want the story to encourage them to change. Thank you. Uh, right here. Yeah, so how do you flesh out and make non-viewpoint characters interesting if your main characters either don't know their motivations or are misunderstanding them? All right. If your main character, your viewpoint character, doesn't understand a side character's motivation or misunderstands them, how do you make sure that that character, that side character still works? Well, the epic fantasy author's answer is, add a viewpoint. Um, that is usually bad advice for most genres. Um, so uh, in this case, do as I say, not as I do. Um, because I will write a 400,000 word book and just add some viewpoints in. Um, even in my 100,000 word books, I'll sometimes just add viewpoints in. Um, Mary Robin hates that, by the way. She'll read a story by me and be like, why is there this random viewpoint and it does not make it? And I'm like, ah, <laughs> shush, shush. Uh, um, but how do you do it without adding that viewpoint in? Um, I would take one of a couple of things. Um, hanging a lantern on it um, is that, that stage play term that lets you make a thing that you think might be a bug into a feature, right? Hang a lantern on the setting piece that, that doesn't look as good as the rest of them, indicating to the audience that you will someday make use of that as a plot point. In this case, having a character who is not the main character and not the side character say, you really don't get them, do you? And then the main character say, yeah, I totally get them, such and such and such and such. And the other character being like, oh man, oh man. Someday you are going to be super embarrassed that you just said that, right? Um, that sort of thing can be really handy. Um, what you don't want, why this can be bad, is if the reader, um, I've told you guys about gorillas in the phone booth, right? What? Uh, I haven't, okay. I've told the little class about it. Um, so gorillas in the phone booth is a thing I learned, this will relate, I promise. Um, the thing I learned in college from one of, my, one of the people in college with me in my master's degree, uh, it stuck with me. He, he, he was reading a story of mine. He said, this part feels like a grill in the phone booth. And I'm like, what? He's like, so imagine you are you know, watching a movie, and a character is having a conversation um, uh, you know, with his girlfriend, um, and they're kind of arguing over finances. And then he walks by, looks up, and there's a gorilla in the phone booth. People don't have phone booths anymore, but pretend we're like 20 years ago when these were a thing. Uh, there's a gorilla in the phone booth, and then he keeps on walking and going. What the grill in the phone booth does is it draws the reader's attention to the point that it, their mind keeps coming back to it and makes them unable to the focus of the task at hand. Once you've seen the grill in the phone booth, it is so irreconcilable with the story you thought you were seeing that your mind keeps going back and you suffer an extreme detachment from the main story in a way that is very bothersome. This often happens with readers if they think you as a writer haven't noticed something or have made a big mistake. And it starts to be this little thing that pushes them further and further out of the story. Um, even if it's a small thing where they're like, but X, but, but how can you not notice this? Other times it happens because you mentioned something that's really interesting as a tease but then don't give enough information about it to the point that readers keep worrying about it. Um, I've, I've read, um, to kind of paraphrase, some student works where like a person gets stabbed in the hand and then has a conversation with another person about something completely unrelated. And I'm like, they are bleeding all over the floor. I cannot pay attention to this other conversation no matter how important it is because they're bleeding to death, right? <laughs> Um, you want to avoid letting your side characters do that to your story. And hanging a lantern on it is one of the good ways where you are basically saying to the reader, this isn't a flaw in the story. I know. I am going to deal with it eventually. What that does is the reader then is like, oh, thank goodness. They file in the back of their head that this is a plot point. I noticed it. I'm smart. It's going to be relevant later on. Thumbs up. 
let me focus on what the story is, um, is on right now. It uh, can be very handy with these sorts of things. Uh, this gets very complicated when you have an untrustworthy narrator, which is kind of what you're going with here, right? Where the, this happens all the time in the Wheel of Time with Matt Cawthon, um, where Matt assesses a situation and it is completely wrong, humorously so, um, and you as the reader are supposed to understand this, right? Dramatic irony, the reader understands the things that the characters don't. Um, this can get very tricky, it can be very hard to write this sort of thing, but if you get it right, readers are gonna love it. Um, so, the, the, just a couple hints on that. All right, go ahead. What's the most of this that you've done in post? Uh, what's the most of this I've done in post? Uh, good question. Um, I will often, uh, I would say half of the time, throw away the first through third chapters of a book. Um, and part of the reason for this, I did this in Skyward. Um, so Skyward, when I was starting off, um, um, in fact, I mean to keep meaning to post these. Adam, we'll get these up, right? The alternate beginnings. Skyward has three different beginnings. And they were all about me trying to get likability, proactivity, and competence down for the main character, Spensa, at the beginning. Um, also in tone and all these promises. A lot of times, by the middle of the book, I n understand what someone's arc is pretty strongly, and I know where I'm going. But the beginning is then really rough. and doesn't match who that character has, um, has become. I just consider it like, um, like I know I'm generally going to throw away the first few chapters. Um, in that case, it wasn't the prologue. It was chapter one and two. Well, we'll get them up. You guys can, can read them. We did get the outline up, right? Um, do we post that up here? Do we? we Right, but we were going to write it on the board. Okay, yes, Adam's going to write on the board where you find the outline for Skyward, right? I promised you I'd get that up, and we keep forgetting to put it on the board. So those internet people who've been asking, it's, uh, you'll be able to find it here. Um, we'll try to get the other uh, beginning chapters of that up, though um, basically the idea is here that I'm totally okay rewriting my beginning um, if my ending is working. Um, one place that I've changed it dramatically, I think I talked about uh, Mistborn 3, where there was a character who was not proactive at all. Uh, this is a character who was going through a depressive, um, deep into depression, right? Because of things that happened in the middle book. And their plot was excruciating to read because they were just depressed the whole time. Um, and I realized a sense of progress, even downward, is way better than nothing at all. I ripped out all of those character scenes. I wrote them all from scratch, and in this one, the character was, had an acti action they were doing that each uh, thing they discovered in this action brought them further down. And there was like a countdown of, you know, he's read uh, 200 of these books and found no answers, he's getting more depressed, and that slide worked way better. Um, that's one of the biggest ones I've done. Um, the other, of course, big one I talked about in class is when I ripped out half of Dalinar's chapters from The Way of Kings, and I replaced them with Adolin chapters because the character was feeling schizophrenic because he was both confident that he was right, that uh, the visions he was seeing was leading him toward something important, and totally frightened he was insane, right? And these did not jive at all. What it turned into was a, was a, had a huge problem with all three of these things, right? He was less likable because he was wishy-washy. And he was less proactive because every action he took was undercut by him worrying he was insane. Moving that out to two characters so that the ca external voice was saying, I really think you're insane, Dad, made Adolin way more um, sympathetic because we've all had family members and loved ones who've gone through an illness and we're really worried that this illness is hurting them and changing them and what do we do, right? It made Dalinar more empathetic because we've all been the person that people haven't believed when we've had something that, you know, is a, is a major thing, we're like, I can go be a writer. I'm not crazy, I'm a prophet. Well, maybe we haven't had that one, but um, <laughs> that idea, splitting those out, added the likability to both of them, and it let them both be proactive, um, rather than back and forth. Uh, those are probably the two biggest changes I've made in any of my books. Uh, yeah, go ahead. How do you separate your characters' voices? How do I separate my characters' voices? Um, what a fantastic question. Um, this goes into what I think I've told you guys before, the grand skill of telling science fiction and fantasy, or writing, right? Which is his ability to, to world build through the eyes of characters. Um, so your go-to here should be letting the character's background, their motivations, 
and their personality influence their descriptions and their diction, right? Um, now, the kind of, um, you can go way too far on this, but an example of this, Robert Jordan has a character who is, you know, very high. She is the Amarillin seat. She is leader of the magic users in this world, basically the highest position you can be. She came from a bunch of fishermen. That her parents were fishers, right? So she still uses metaphor, uh, metaphors about gutting fish and about things like this, which makes her a delight to read because this character that you expect to be regal and queenly is talking about gutting fish because that's her background. Um, that's a good example of using you, you know, the contrast there to, to get someone across. But letting someone's background influence the metaphors they use. And it, it, it should be more than, for instance, the, the cliched way to do this is, the character who has a scientific mind doesn't use contractions, right? You've all probably read this or seen this. The very smart person says cannot instead of can't. Totally valid. You can totally do that. But it should go further than that, right? You should be saying this character has a, a training in uh, the ac academy, right? They, they have a PhD. They're going to speak differently. They're going to be rhetorically grounded. They're going to use their, you know, they're going to, uh, arrange their arguments in such a way to use rhetoric. This character does not. This character comes from living on the streets and going with their gut. Their argument is going to be, you're wrong. I know you're wrong because I've stabbed three people like you, right? <laughs> and they all died and I lived. You're wrong. And this person is going to be like, you're wrong because of this and this and this. Can't you see how great my logical arguments are? Um, that is way stronger than this character uses no contractions and this character uses slang. You should still have this character use string and this character's diction reflect uh, uh, the academy, but the way that they argue, the way they see the world, a character who grew up like I did with an upper, upper middle class background is going to have a very different perspective on how likely they are to achieve their dreams and goals than a person who has a lower, low class upbringing, right? These things should reflect in your characters. Um, try to get this across. In fact, one of the best things you can do to learn how to um, write stronger writing is learn how to make your dialogue work without dialogue tags and without any descriptions around it. Now, you rarely will put this in a book, but if you can write a scene where three or four different characters are having an argument and we can track who is who with no dialogue tags, then you're starting to get there, right? If we're like, oh, look at this. This person's paragraphs are always huge and well thought out. And this person's paragraphs are always short sentences with lots of exclamation points. And this character always stutters and pauses and has lots of ellipses. And wow, I can follow them all because of the diction. And of course, they're all arguing for different things from different directions. And this one just used a metaphor about you know, iron working, where this metaphor talked about burning pages. And when you can do that and let your dialogue be that strong, you are getting there, right? Um, one of the things that I see, and I do this too much too, in a lot of writing, is being sloppy by letting your, um, the things you put around the dialogue do the heavy lifting. Uh, I'm not very happy with you, he said angrily, right? Rather than, how dare you, exclamation point. One is stronger than the other. Your natural instincts most likely will be to write, I'm not happy with you, he said angrily. Um, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of writing textbooks and things will say, get rid of the adverbs, um, that you shouldn't be using adverbs. I do not go that strong on it. But they also will say, don't use said bookisms. Don't use things like he exclaimed or he shouted or things like that. Again, I don't go that, that far. You'll have to decide where you want to be. Um, J.K. Rowling loves both of those, and she's the best-selling author of our time. So um, take all this with a grain of salt. But if you can move that angrily, um, if you can cut that and make sure the diction sounds angry, your writing goes up a notch in strength. Um, and if you can show in your, even your descriptions that somebody really hates this other person by the way they describe how fiddly they are with their hair and how, of course, their perfect shoes are polished and things like that, rather than saying, she really hated Amy because she was a prep, right? <laughs> um, if you could never have those lines in your writing and everyone gets it, 
it's going to be way, way stronger writing. Uh, this is a continual, lifelong quest for most writers um, that we always are trying to get better at, and very few actually get where it's really, really good, and particularly not in first drafts, but that's how you do it. And if you can do that, if you can do the things I'm just talking about here, then you are going to sell books fast, right? Because if your opening chapters are full of almost no info dumps, full of character dialogue that snaps off the page and tells you who they are by the way that they talk and gets across and evokes setting and character just through these sort of contextual clues, then you are doing better than 99% of the people who are submitting books or self-publishing their books and trying to make it. Um, if you can practice one skill, do that one, all right? Okay, uh, time for a few more. Go ahead. So I'm wondering, how do you craft good villain motivations? How do you craft good villain motivations? So um, this depends on the type of villain you want. Different stories use different types of villains. And really, it's going to depend on how far up or down on the likability scale is your villain, right? Um, a villain who's very low on the likability scale but very high on the other two um, will be different than one that you characterize a little bit in the middle. Um, an iconic villain, such as Sauron, is very different from a character who is struggling and changing, like Gollum. Right? Gollum is a character who's, who's changing in likability and in proactivity through the course of the story in various different modes, and Sauron does it. Sauron is a giant burning red eye that's going to destroy the world. That is it. Yes, I know the extended uh, blah, 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 Silmarillion, right? Uh, um, in the actual story, it's a giant eye that's going to destroy, this, destroy the world. Um, those fulfill two different roles, and they're both perfectly valid. But if you want a villain with motivations that make sense, um, you're going to have to work harder than you work with someone like Sauron. Uh, Gollum's a great example. It can be a fantastical thing. He just really wants this ring, right? He doesn't even really know why. He's been corrupted by it, but he really, really wants the ring, and we can see that he wants it. He has an established motivation, and the fact that he's changing and wavering back and forth is what makes him work. I think I told you guys, right? I made my mom go to the Lord of the Rings films when they were coming out 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> um, right? And she had never read a fantasy book before. This is before I published any, so she hadn't read any of mine. And I took her, and she had two takeaways from those films. The one was, boy, I sure hope Aragorn ends up with that nice elf girl. I like her. <laughs> and number two, little Smeagol, please be good, right? And she would say that after like the second movie. She's like, Smeagol's going to turn out to be good, right? And she was hooked by him. Um, I know, it was kind of heartbreaking, right? Um, yeah, he gets to have his ring. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but, so those characters do different things. Um, different adaptations of Joker do different things. Um, and so you're, you're going to ask yourself, you do basically the same sorts of things um, and you do want to, you can distinguish in your head between villain and antagonist. It's sometimes helpful to split those two apart. Antagonist is someone that is working against the goals of the main character. Villain is someone who is doing expressly evil things. Those are my definitions. You don't have to use them, right? But for instance, um, the, uh, the principal in Ferris Bueller's, Bueller's Day Off starts off mostly as antagonist, slightly villainous, and then gets more and more villainous through the way the story progresses. But you can imagine um, to Tommy Lee Jones in The Fugitive. Tommy Lee Jones is the antagonist of that show, but he is not the villain. The villain is someone else. Um, but most of the time with that is Tommy Lee Jones. So you got to be kind of separating those two out. And if you want your villain to work, make sure their motivations, if you want to villain whose motivations, you know, the, someone we empathize with, just give them a realistic motivations, just like a hero, a protagonist, then put them cross purposes with the protagonist for some reason, and it'll rip our hearts out. All right? Yeah, go ahead. How do you have an antagonist who's not inherently evil, but is very competent and productive, that you don't want the readers to like? How do you make a character who's not evil, but is very pro proactive and competent that you don't want the readers to like? 
Well, you can show someone not being evil, but also not being good. Uh, and this is generally around, they're not kicking puppies, right? But they also are Javert, classic example. Javert wants to catch Jean Valjean, it's a, he's a, but he has no mercy. He's not kicking puppies, but he is not merciful at all. We do not like Javert until we start to see him humanized, and then he no longer can exist in this system because he has fallen out of his role, so he has to jump off a bridge, right? Um, but Javert is a classic example. Uh, the fugitive, um, Tommy Lee Jones, is another example, though we like him um, because of this. Uh, so you can do this. Anyone cross-purpose, if you do this right for your protagonist, and you put the antagonist cross-purpose of them, even if it's understandable, then we will not want them to succeed. Even sometimes, if your hero is the antagonist, as the heroes are in Infinity War, you will want the protagonist, who is the villain, to be successful because of the way they are protagging and the way their motivations are established. And so you will watch a movie where the heroes fail and the villain wins, spoiler, um, <laughs> where the protagonist wins and the antagonists lose, but the positions are reversed. All right, let's do one more. Go ahead. Right, how do you write a character who doesn't understand their own motivations or who is lying to themselves? Um, so this is where, number one, small successes at the beginning are really handy for establishing this, right? Having the character be proactive about something that isn't involved in the larger scope and showing us they can be and showing us what they, what they actually need through that and then having them verbally say, no, that's not what I need, it's what I never needed, is a really good way um, so first impressions are really important. If you impress upon us that this character is really proactive in their small sphere, but they don't think they're competent enough to go out into the, word, world, the wide world, we will believe what you showed us, not what they say. So make sure your shows are on point. Um, the other way to do this is to have a character that we do trust, who is a trustworthy narrator, tell that character the truth and make sure that we see that and empathize with that so that we are knowing this character is going to learn and change. All right? All right, guys, we'll do character two next week. Write down any questions I didn't get to, and we'll do it in two, two weeks.